Welcome to On Texas Football. And I've got Rod Babers alongside me. I'm Bobby Burton. Uh, we're going to talk a little grading the team. It's time. Year-end grades are always interesting, Rod, uh, because you just don't know, uh, you, you know, are you grading on a curve? Are you grading against what expectations <laughs> were? What, let's do it against, you know, kind of just basically where we thought they ended up. I don't want to do this against where we thought they were going to be, but were they an A, a championship level team, B, uh, a 10 win, nine win team, C, kind of that eight, seven wins, D, six or, you know, and then yeah. F, four and below, you know, I think that's, <laughs> that's a good way to do it. So people understand what we're talking about. Let's start with Quinn Ewers uh, in the quarterback spot, because obviously that's the one that gets the most uh, most notoriety and the most uh, love, I guess. Uh, he finishes the year uh, 3,479 3, uh, passing yards, Rod, 22 touchdowns, just six interceptions. Uh, he was 272 of 394 overall, 69% completion ratio, a big jump from a year ago. To this year, probably the most promising thing as we look forward to next year, even is what's going to be that next jump for Quinn Ewers. How would you assess, uh, uh, assess Quinn Ewers' season in Austin? Uh, yeah, I thought we saw a lot of improvement from Quinn Ewers in year two. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that I liked about Quinn's game is I, I think he plays some of his best football in big games. We saw in the Big 12 title game, had his best game ever, right, of his career. Uh, the Oklahoma game, even though he started out a little shaky, probably those last three quarters of play at Oklahoma game, he was excellent. And even in the Oklahoma game, starting out shaky with the interceptions early, we talked about this. You know, I love seeing the, the character. I love seeing, you know, the grit. Uh, the ability to bounce back after a bad performance. Like he did not go in a downward spiral. Trust me, I've seen quarterbacks uh, go in a downward spiral after a shaky start. That didn't happen. He bounced back with a strong performance. Uh, in the Bama game, we obviously know he played a, a good game in a big game. So I like that about him. Uh, also, you know, something I saw from Quinn, I saw leadership this year. Uh, I saw him assert himself. Uh, I know that's something that he had to work on. He was not a naturally a vocal leader. Uh, that's understandable. Not everybody has that kind of personality or disposition, but at a natural leadership position without Bijan and Rojo there, uh, it was going to be time for him to step up. And even after the Sugar Bowl, he talked about it again, about looking forward to, uh, you know, leading, being a leader in the culture and leading some of those off-season activities and being the catalyst uh, for uh, that leadership and having guys looking to him. So he he referenced that, you know, and, and obviously we haven't got in the news yet that uh, Quinn is coming back. So we don't necessarily know for sure, but we assume Quinn's coming back. Uh, but I, I give Quinn about a, I give him a B minus. I'm going B minus for Quinn. I, and the reason I, and that's a harsh grading system for me for Quinn. And the reason that is harsh is because I think he's got, a tremendous upside, and I and I do think the leap that you get from year two to year three could be exponential if we're grading off the the, the leap from year one to year two in the Sark system. Uh, he will he will have I mean a lot of his targets are going to be gone. A lot of the, the the comfort level and the chemistry he has with wide receivers like X Man and uh, that's obviously uh, some of those uh, Jay Witt, some of those other guys. Uh, he's not going to have those those available targets, but I do think the maturity in his game coming back to get better, re getting better and more comfortable, deeper into the progressions, uh, getting to the progressions a little bit quicker, the footwork, the mechanics, so that it doesn't deteriorate as he gets through those progressions. Right now, he is pretty much known as a one, a kind of a, a one week, a one read wide window throw, kind of that first read wide window throw uh, a quarterback. And I think you can get past that to being a guy that can work deeper into progression. So I'll go B minus. Deeper into progressions, put the ball on a line more often, maybe when necessary, throw some guys open at times. There's a lot of improvement, better, better pocket awareness. He got better pocket awareness as the season went on. I thought, Rod, uh, we yeah, even yeah. saw that improvement this year. He's got a lot of things he can work on. The facts are that the talent kind of oozes, you know, <laughs> that's where, that's why he's going to get graded toughly uh, to be fair, because you could be talking about another quarterback with lesser talent where you're, oh, well, we'll give him an A because he's, you know what I mean? He doesn't have that upside. So you're good. Exactly you, right. you are kind of grading Quinn tough. You say B, B minus. I'm going to go A minus B plus. Okay. 69% completion rate after a year ago being at 58.1. At I, I felt like he was a key reason Texas took the next step this year. Um, is he perfect? Absolutely not. Is he a uh, work in progress? 
Yes, uh, but I, I thought he was championship caliber uh, on that edge as good. Uh, you know, there are other quarterbacks that maybe had better years in the in the uh, Big 12. Uh, maybe uh, a guy like uh, Dylan Gabriel, but I still think he was at least one of the top two or three, one of the top handful of quarterbacks in the Big 12. And I, yeah. I think obviously may have the most upside of, of any of the starters uh, in that right. league. Uh, but now we're going to the SEC, so we'll see how it goes. But that's where I would go with my grades. Yeah. Let's go to running back. Man, talk about a surprise. Yeah. You, I mean, I grade this. I, I'm going to go first on this one. I'm going to grade this at A, A+. Plus. I would have never thought this team would average five yards a carry, even including in sacks that you get. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you include the backup and stuff. I mean, look, Jonathan Brooks averaged 6.1 yards per carry. Jaden Blue, 6.1. Cedric Baxter, 4.8. But he did a lot of the heavy lifting and and uh, goal line situations. You also look at the number of receptions they had. Yeah, that trio alone had sixty three catches this year. That's a lot of work. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, what two hundred, almost four hundred carries for a uh, three hundred and seventy five carries between them. The three of them, another yeah. sixty plus uh, catches. That's a lot. That's a load. And I felt like Jonathan Brooks was special at times, uh, particularly from game probably the end of the third quarter against um, Alabama all the way through uh, when he got injured against TCU. He was special. Uh, Just a a really tremendous running back. He's headed off the NFL. What did you give the running back room, uh, Rod? I gave him an A. Uh, Yep, I gave him an A. Uh, I gave him an A because not only post Bijan and Rojo, that was expected regression and nobody would (laughs) have, you know, I don't think anybody would have blamed the the running back room or the running back coach or anybody there for there being regression post Bijan and Rojo. There really wasn't. Um, I mean, that, Jonathan Brooks really kind of started out just with those guys finished. And what I love about Jonathan Brooks story is we can't forget he didn't start off as a starter. Right. That's the Cedric, Cedric Baxter actually won the starting job. Uh, and because of, you know, great football character, going back to that term again um, and his his competitive spirit, he ended up winning that job and becoming the best running back in the country until he got hurt. And I think he was a front runner for the Doak Walker Award. I'll give you a stat. Uh, shout out to my man Christian Corona because he's the one that came up with this. Uh, Jonathan Brooks, uh, one of 10 running backs this year to average over six yards per carry on 175 plus carries while running for at least 10 touchdowns. Of those 10, he's one of two to have 25 receptions, at least 25 receptions, and average at least 10 yards per catch. And he's the only power, power five running back to do so. And he did that in 10 games. In his last eight games, uh, he basically that's when he really caught fire and ended up running for over a thousand yards just in the last eight games, 6.4 yards per carry. He he was a revelation for Texas. And you could argue he was the the lifeblood to this offense uh, at, at, you know, at the peak of the season. I'm with you. I'll give him. And then after he goes down, they expect it, you know, travesty. And it's going to be uh, an absolute disaster because you lost Jonathan Brooks in the running game, still had 200 yard rushers. After that, Jaden Blue rushed for 100 yards at one point. Cedric Baxter rushed for 100 yards at one point. Um, I, yeah, I'm with you. And Tashard Choice just continues to prove he's one of the best coaches in the country. Running backs, they get an A, no doubt. Yeah, I just think you have to go that direction. Um, heading into the year, wide receivers. Probably, I think you and I considered that the strength of the offense. Mm-hmm. Not only did you have Jordan Whittington returning, uh, but you also had Xavier Worthy, who was getting healthy. Then you add Adonai Mitchell, who we knew was was as good as advertised coming in. I mean, he'd done it at the highest level in, in college already in national championship games. Uh, but even I did they even surpass expectations for you? Maybe not in yardage, mm-hmm. but just in overall impact. I mean, they didn't drop many balls this year. No. I mean, what did five drops throughout the whole year, like true drops? I mean, really, I mean, whether that was influenced by Chris Jackson, the new wide receivers coach, or Xavier Worthy re- being refocused and healthy. I felt like the wide receiver group at Texas was borderline special. Again, I would give them an A in, in a similar fashion. I thought they were championship level. Uh, yeah, with them, I actually went with an A, uh, A minus okay. um, with, with the wide receiving group. Um, and the re- I was saying – the A minus really is not really about them. It's more about the wide receiving group as a, as a whole. Uh, you just don't see a lot. I, I've said this, you know, we don't see Jay Witt, you know, 
as a targeted wide receiver very often. Um, I think he could have been a bigger weapon for them. That's more on Sark than the wide receivers. I think they did achieve. So I went A minus with that group. Uh, I thought they were great. Uh, they were clutch. AD Mitchell at the clutch reception that was uh, in that TCU game. Um, also, I love the fact that he became a red zone weapon for him. Honestly, without AD Mitchell's red zone receptions, I don't know where they would be in red zone offense. They were already, you know, pretty subpar there. And he was one of the best weapons in the country in the red zone. Love that about his game. Um, I also, you know, like I said, Jay Witt as a blocker was one of the best young best blockers in all of uh, the Big 12 at the wide receiver position. So I went with A minus just because I wanted, I, I thought it was going to be a trio of wide receivers. And it really was more of a duo with Jay Witt kind of sprinkled in. And that's not, like I said, that's not even the wide receiver's fault. So I probably shouldn't hold that against them. Uh, that's just kind of the way Sark does, does it. And, and we'll get to the tight end position also. And you brought a running back. There's so many targets being taken from the wide receivers for the running backs. Like Jay Witt, that's some of Jay Witt's targets, but they go to the running backs out of the backfield or, you know, on screen passes or to, to JT Sanders. So my gripe, the reason I, I guess I docked him a little bit was actually not their fault, but I just thought it'd be, like I said, it'd be more variety within that wide receiving group. I thought Jay Witt would get more targets. I thought you see more of a young John Tate Cook, just not as much as I thought. So it ended up being just two guys pretty much in your wide receiving core, but that's more on Sark, like I said. So I'll go A minus though. Interesting. Uh, what about tight end? Uh, Longhorns. Uh, I, I, well, before I go to tight end, I want to say this. Um, I looked at the numbers. Uh, Jay Witt, had 42 catches for 505, but AD Mitchell had just 13 more catches, but almost 350 more yards. So I didn't you, realize that Jay would have that many catches, actually. Yeah, but, but the point being though, for you and everyone else, is it's clear that both Worthy and Mitchell were those guys that were vertical, and Whittington operated underneath as kind of that that go-to guy uh in certain situations, but not to your point, a prolific. Uh, prolific slot receiver. He wasn't getting 10 targets a game like some people like to do with their slots. I, I, I agree with that. Xavier Worthy, 75 for 1,014 yards. He led the team, five touchdowns. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, you mentioned the red zone efficiency for him or the effectiveness. He had 11 TDs. All right, let's go, let's go to, which is just a great number for a wide receiver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's go to tight end. J.T. Sanders, Gunnar Helm, the two primaries. Uh, Sanders, of course, gets the uh, most attention, and rightfully so. He's the the passing pa pass receiving target of that tandem. Typically, he had actually fewer catches this year, but more yardage mm -hmm. per catch than a year ago. He went for forty five for six hundred and eighty two this year, compared to fifty four and six thirteen a year ago. Uh, we saw some improvement in his blocking. Uh, we saw Gunnar Helm. Also come on a little bit this year. I think you saw that. Uh, what, what did you give the uh, tight ends at this point? Uh, uh, I, I gave the tight ends an, an A uh, because I love the development of Gunnar Helm. And when JT Sanders went down, um, I thought, man, the tight end position uh, for Texas is, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a drastic loss because Sark loves 40. Uh, he loves working out with 12 personnel. He comes out one back, two tight ends about 40 percent of the time. Um, he now, Since he's been working in more of the uh, the big 12 package. But usually if you give it uh, Sark, you look at his tenure here in Texas, he's probably close to, you know, 35, 40 percent running 12 personnel. He wants to run, run more of it. Uh, but I love the way that Gunnar Helm stepped up. I love his development. Uh, but man, you go look at it. Three 100 yard games for JT Sanders. Uh, that's the most ever by a UT tight end. Um, he's got the career receptions record for a tight end. He's got the uh, season receiving yards record for a tight end. And those are, I mean, those are big time records. So uh, JT Sanders, he's one of the greatest tight ends in Texas football history. I think I predicted he'd go down statistically as the greatest tight end in Texas football history. I don't know if that's going to happen, but he's in the conversation. Uh, so yeah, I'll go A with the tight ends. I think they more than met and maybe even exceeded my expectations as a group. Yeah. I, 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 I have no problem with A, A minus. You know, I, I really don't. I think that they were in that championship level as well. All right. Offensive line. Uh, different story here in that they had a little hot and cold year. Start off cold against Rice, allowing, a, what, five sacks? Was that in the number? Um, and then it was, you know, and then went to Baylor, had a good one, then didn't have such a great one in, in here and there, whether it was facing that three high defense and couldn't move the 
the three down linemen. Um, but they seem to end the end of the year on an up note until the bowl game where they, you know, one of the things that reared its ugly head for them time and time again in 2023 had to do with the pre-snap penalties yep. um, and maybe penalties in general, their biggest bugaboo. But uh, ultimately they were the foundation for an offense uh, for an offense that finished really high in the national rankings, Rod. Um, what, what do you make of the offensive line? Uh, and, and what you thought about them eventually. I, I went with a B-plus here because I thought they had the pieces of the puzzle, uh, but they didn't always put it together. I went with a B, so we're pretty close. Yeah, uh, I went with a B because of the, some of the inconsistency. Much like Quinn Ewers, I, I grade harshly because of his oh, tremendous it's... upside because we know what his potential could be. Number one, oh, he's a 1-1 one, one guy, as you always call him, Bobby. Yep. Uh, this old line, man, the, the amount of, pure talent on the O-line and veteran experience on the O-line, right? You got, I mean, they, they brought back everybody from the, um, the last year's O-line. Um, they had a lot of continuity, a lot of it, a lot of experience on this O-line and a lot of high end potential. And even some of the backups had even higher upside than some of the starters. So you had depth on the O-line too. So I expected them to take a huge leap. Uh, and I think they did in some areas. It just wasn't consistent. Uh, they did allow 28 sacks. I think they allowed 71 tackles for loss on the season. Um, you know, those are not bad numbers at all, but I think they, they those numbers could have been better for them. And some of those sacks, by the way, are on the quarterback, right? That's uh, a lot of that is on Quinn Ewers, uh, not, uh, you know, getting the ball out quickly, uh, you know, obviously staring at the pressure instead of feeling the pressure, the pocket presence, those types of things. Um, but what I liked about it, here's a couple of stats about the old line and the pro football focus. I'll give them credit for it. Texas offensive line was actually one of the best at, keeping a quarterback in pass protection and keeping their quarterback clean in pass protection. They had an 89.3 pass blocking grade that ranked fourth by pro football focus. And they were third in the FBS with it just an 11.7% pressure rate allowed, which is pretty damn good. Uh, and if you look at uh, total overall pressures allowed, uh, they were top five in the power five in fewest pressures allowed. So the, the, the the offensive line actually has some impressive stats. They were a semifinalist for the Joe Moore Award. Um, I just think my expectations were a little high, and we're basing this off our expectations. Um, so I'm going to give them a B because I thought I think they can achieve a lot more. And I got a lot of respect for Kyle Flood as an offensive line coach. Um, so I know one of, the, one of the biggest issues with offensive line play at the college and the pro level is lack of good O-line coaching. Um, the, the Longhorns don't have to worry about that, uh, about inadequate coaching. They're getting that too. Uh, so I, I think this group is going to take that huge leap. I think between them and Quinn Ewers next season, that'll be the identity of the offense. It'll just be the offensive line is dominant. They can always win the battle in the trenches. And Quinn Ewers, third-year quarterback, so comfortable that he rarely makes bad decisions and always makes the, the right throw. Interesting. All right, before we go into the offensive grade overall, I want to review what we've got here. I went B plus, A minus for quarterback. You went B minus. We both went A for for running backs, I think we were in unison on that one. I went A for wide receiver. You went A minus. Tight ends, I think we both went A and A minus. Did we both go A there? I know I did. Yeah, yeah, I went A. I went A. Okay, and then offense line, I went B plus, and you went B. Now let's grade the offense as a whole. A um, couple of stats for you to consider, Rod. Finished number four in total offense with 477 yards per game. That's pretty stout. Finished 14th in yards per play. Um, based, you know, some schools didn't get as many snaps. Still, Texas finished 14th in that category. The only two offenses that fared better in that category for Texas than Texas in the Big 12 were both Oklahoma and Kansas. Um, mm -hmm. So it's an interesting, interesting grouping there. You get a sense for where they, things are at. What, what are your thoughts on the total offensive output? Uh, certainly they were championship level from a standpoint of the big 12, maybe not good enough though to win a national championship. I would, I would say. Uh, yeah, honestly, my only big complaint with the offense as a whole, um, and this even includes, you know, Sark, Sark's play calling. I'm going to throw the Sark's play calling in there too, because I thought Sark took a huge leap this year in becoming a chess master and winning the chess match within the game. He didn't win it in the sugar bowl against Kaelin the but, I think I've, I saw him this season 
win the battle of adjustments more than I've seen him win in any season uh, so far during his tenure here at Texas. Um, and he usually win the battle of game plan and preparation. I think that's part of the overall offense uh, and offense evaluation that I'm doing. But I would say the my biggest gripe is his red zone offense and touchdown percentage in the red zone. Everything else, Texas is among the best in the country. <laughs> when you're talking about the passing game or the running game, um, I have no real complaints other than they're, I think, 100. they were 120th in touchdown percentage in the red zone, and it came back to haunt them. Um, the Shakespearean irony of that is that it came back to haunt them because in the last game of the season, they had two opportunities in the red zone, and if they scored touchdowns there, they're in a national title. And they couldn't score touchdowns in that situation. They had to set up for a field goal, and then obviously at the uh, the game potential game winning drive that uh, was stopped by Washington. So kudos to them. But your inability to score touchdowns in the red zone, you know that's that was the only limitation really to the offense. So I'll, overall, I'll go I'll go with the offense as a I'll go A minus because that's a big that's a that's a that, that's a really big detriment. That's a really big liability to have not being great in money time in the red zone, but that's, that's the only thing. That's the only bad thing I saw from Texas. Um, I think that the other piece that, that, that problem, the red zone problem made them inconsistent at times from a scoring perspective. So they either walloped you or it was a tight game a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by that? And it yeah. kind of was predicated on whether or not they could score in the red zone by and large this season. Um, I, I think an A minus is fine. I was leaning actually more to a B plus. Okay. I didn't necessarily think the sum of all gotcha. parts equaled the individual play at all times because of that inconsistency in the red zone. Okay. Make, makes sense. Now, yeah. uh, nitpicking, yeah. your point, that's very, very nitpicky. Would I take this Texas offense over any of the last 15 years, except for Colt McCoy's senior year or even Colt McCoy's junior year? Yeah, I would. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. give a, the Texas offense of any of the last 15 years an A minus. They'd be sitting in the B B minus range for just about always. You see what yeah. I'm saying? So it's yeah. a little no, more yeah. to be that, but finishing this, top 10 in total yards, 14 yeah. in yards per play. That's that's strong stuff. That's strong stuff. I actually, I'm with you. I actually think this offense has more weapons than the 2009 offense. Oh, it does, it has more weapons. It just had that that Colt, Colt and Jordan Shipley was so good. Yeah, the greatest wide receiver of all time and one of the greatest college quarterbacks of all time. They they were a plus 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 players that right. they just kind of that offense could ride them all the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah the the 08 offense I thought was better. For example, 08 offense was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the 08 was the, the better one. But literally, yeah. we're talking about. I do think we're talking about the best Texas offense in the last 15 years. And we're still grading them pretty hard. I mean, so yeah, I think that's important for people to realize. All right, Rob, we're going to come back and try to do the uh, defense. I want to give people a, a, a fair – I want to give that side of the ball a fair shake and really try to dive down and talk about it, But especially with so many guys on that side of the ball leaving next year. I, I think we need to kind of dive into that a little heavy. So, all right, that's going to do it for today. Uh, Rod Babers, myself, Bobby Burton, thanks for watching on Texas Football, talking grades on the offense. Hook them and have a good weekend. Welcome.